the corporate finance I loved the most, I think, because it was kind of transactional and I really wanted to then put those skills into place in a real business, like write a real business plan for a company that I work in and go and get that money from the bank and then use that money, you know, for whatever project it was. And the analysis around acquisitions that I'd done for clients, you know, I wanted to be able to do that in my own business. And sure enough, joining Coastal, we made acquisitions and I was able to put into practice some of those skills, which was awesome. And you can't put a cost on social value, your impact on the community and certainly the impact on the environment. Those things are just as important, you know, and the biggest one is our people, which is huge, much more important than uh, the bottom line. About employee ownership, we realised that a fantastic model for our business, we wish we'd realised it before, because of the, the, the high impact that our people have on our customers and our, our reputation, we thought, let's give these guys a vested interest in the business. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Emily Dell, Group Commercial Director at Coastal Recycling, a Devon-based recycling and waste management company. I'm Mark Greaves from PK Francis Clark, and I'll be your host. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to get updates and notifications on when our latest episodes are available. Hi, Emily. How are you today? Hello, Mark. I'm very well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. This is my first podcast, so I'm actually quite excited. It doesn't take much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a fairly exciting job, which we'll come on to describe, so I'm quite, quite flattered yeah. by that. <laughs> um, why don't we start with the, the business itself? Why don't you tell me what Coastal Recycling actually does? What's the business? Yeah, sure. So Coastal Recycling is the largest independent um, waste and recycling company in, in the region. Um, we operate a variety of different recycling services. So we skip and roll and off hire, which we would offer to anyone from a domestic household through to great big blue chip house builders. Similarly, wheelie bins, um, again, small corner shops through to great big campsites or Exeter University, for example. Then we also do all the garden waste composting across Devon for Devon County Council. It's about 60 or thousand tons. Um, we process it, we, we shred and screen it and make it into a a beautiful pass 100 standard compost which then goes out onto farmers fields um, for use in agriculture and then the other area is energy um, we used to operate our own landfill site up in north devon that filled a couple of years ago um, it was operating since the 70s quite a big landfill site and produces a lot of methane which we capture um, and then we have gas turbines turning that into electricity and, and we power 2,000 homes across north devon um, as well as solar panels as well. So, um, and then the other area, of course, all that waste that comes to us from skips and wheelie bins, we process. So we have a huge processing facility. The main one is in Exeter, where we, we process the construction and demolition that comes in through wet weight uh, skips and also the, what we call dry mix recycling, which comes in through the wheelie bins and from local authorities um, and other customers, which will be paper, cans, plastic, sort of the, the dry cleaner materials. Um, and once all of those materials have been separated, we then send them off in their individual forms to be made into something else by another processor. We we process about 300,000 tonnes of, of waste across all the operations. Um, we've got 150 staff and about 20 million turnover. That's us in a nutshell. Very good. So how much of what you actually process actually ends up in landfill or being wasted then? Uh, on average, across all of it, we'll process, uh, we'll recycle more than 90%. Whoa. Yeah. Has that changed a lot over the last decade then? Yeah, it's definitely improved as the technologies have, have improved and, and as we've had greater visibility of those wastes and had conversations with customers um, and encouraged them to segregate better at their sites, for example. Um, so in line with their own desires to improve their recycling, that's resulted in us improving the overall recycling um, in what we do. Excellent. I'll come back to working with customers as we talk, go through the business. What's your day-to-day -day role? So my title is commercial director. Um, historically, I'm, I'm a finance person. So I did, I did, um, I was an accountant before uh, and trained with uh, Bishop Fleming, worked with Ernst & Young doing mergers and acquisitions. Um, so when I joined, I was predominantly finance. I was the financial controller. Um, and then that led to finance director. But about 18 months ago-ish, um, we, we, we made some changes with, with directors in different roles. And um, I took a more commercial role, which is much more interesting, <laughs> I have to say. Left the spreadsheets behind. I do still have a light touch interest in spreadsheets, of course. I, I always will. But um, 
this role is much more looking outward. You know, where are we in the market? What what do our customers want? And how do we align our service to, to what they want and make sure we're, we're working with them to achieve their goals? So it's running the sales team, the customer services team, and, and looking overall at the business a bit more and, and the strategy and, you know, how, how to be better, really. It must be much more fulfilling, actually yeah. seeing direct influence. Yeah, definitely. And I'll never stop thinking about things from a financial perspective because as an accountant, you can't, but it's much more all-rounded. So maybe before where I might be challenging people on on something from a cost perspective, now I'll see, well, actually, you know, I can see from the customer perspective, we do need to, to do it differently. So it's it's a, it's changed my views for the better. It's a sort of evolution on that, going from a focus on cost to a focus on value overall. Absolutely, yeah. And you can't put a, a, a cost on social value, for example, which maybe we'll talk about separately, or your impact on the community and certainly the impact on the environment. Those things are just as important um, you know, and the biggest one is our people, yeah, which is which is huge. They, they're, they're much more important than uh, the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> there is no bottom line without those things, ultimately. Is <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's um, people, planet, and profit balancing, which is a key mantra. I want to pick up on that finance a little. In that, regular listeners to the podcast will have seen that Mitch Tonks, Amanda Stansfield, and a few others. Um, actually started their career in finance mm. before going on to run um, very different businesses. Is there something in the training there that is producing that sort of caliber of people like yourself? Yeah, I, I think it must be down to the individuals. For me, I was brought up in a business. My, my parents had a cafe. So from a very, very young age, I was working um, and wanting to earn the money and wanting to you know, understand how businesses work with, with, with staff and costs and all of that. And I, I was very exposed to it. So I think it was in my blood. Um, and then when I worked in, in audit, I was very interested in all the different companies and, and, and how they operated. Um, the corporate finance I loved the most, I think, um, because it was kind of transactional and I really wanted to then put in play, put those skills into place in a real business, like write a real business plan for a, a company that I work in and go and get that money from the bank and then use that money, you know, for, for whatever project it was. And the analysis around acquisitions that I'd done for clients, you know, I wanted to be able to do that, you know, in, in my own business. And sure enough, joining Coastal, we made acquisitions and I was able to put into practice some of those skills, which which was awesome. Well, our listeners will know my uh, bias there in the, the corporate finance um, <laughs> community at large is the real excitement. It is. They're the hub of the accountants <laughs> at that stage. Um, so how did you first then become involved with Coastal? You mentioned about the corporate finance side. Yeah. How did you become involved? Yeah, well, first of all, I actually took a short-term contract with um, Coastal Recycling. They were looking for someone to help with a tender. And I was I just had a baby and it worked really well to just do part-time for a few months um, on a particular tender, um, trying to win um, a big a, a tender for the Devon County Council. S unfortunately, we didn't win. I don't think it was my work. It was the it was around the pricing and other factors. But doing that project, um, I got to know the people there, and uh, then an opportunity arose for a financial controller. So it became a permanent a permanent role. Well, you mentioned Exeter City Council there. Perhaps we can go back a little on that in terms of the origins of the business, because it started out, or the origins of it started out within the County Council, didn't they? It did. That's right. Yeah. So back in the sort of uh, 90s, um, Devon Waste Management, which was the original name of, of Coastal, uh, was part of Devon County Council. Um, and at that time, it ran the landfill site in North Devon. It ran the recycling centres across Devon and the composting contract. So that's what it did. And then it, it came out of Devon County Council by a management buyout and was privately owned ever since. Um, and there were several rounds of MBOs over the years, which, which took it on its journey really from being wholly local authority focused through to a much more commercial focus. Um, so it bought it bought a skip business and a new and a transfer station. Um, at the stage I joined, which was about eleven years ago, it had bought that skip business and the transfer station fairly recently before that. So it operated a few a few trucks. Um, it had just bought the first dust cart, which is a wheelie bin dust cart. Um, and so the commercial side was still a very small part uh, of what we did. Um, but then the next big thing we did was to buy processing equipment to process the dry mix recycling that I talked about and at that time all we had was our own dust cart picking up a few a few customers 
recycling and um we we spent a few hundred thousand on the on the kit actually we spent more installing it than we did on actually buying it because we bought it from a company that that went under um but we, we installed that and we, I remember seeing these sort of Coke bottles and milk bottles trundling over the conveyor belts thinking, oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> we need some more material here. Um, and it did make losses for a while. We did sustain losses. But gradually we we attracted more tonnage from other companies. So other big waste companies that, that maybe they they pulled their material up to Bristol, for example, to, to process before. They would then come and it's economically viable for them to bring it to us. Um, and of course, we grew our own rounds, and then we approached local authorities, and we and we've got domestic recycling um, our way, and we won some tenders. So we've grown it, and now it's a twenty four hour operation, bursting at the seams, and and we want to upgrade the the kits, and it, it's done really well. Um, so through the growth of that area, through um, we've also bought wheelie bin businesses, and we've grown the the skip side dramatically just through employing some really great people, you know, in the business to go out and win work. Um, and our kind of reputation of being an independent, personable business where, you know, we really care. We have, we appoint an account manager to look after a customer and give them feedback on what's going into their, into their skips and bins. Um, so reputationally and organically, we've, we've, we've grown to what we are today. And when I, work, when I last calculated it, um, the local authority income is about 14% of what we do. So huge transition over those years of, of, of focus. That's quite a brave move. I mean, now everyone would look at that operation. Well, of course we do that now. But you're going back 10 or 11 years making that sort of investment was quite a brave move at that yeah, stage. It was. It, it, it was and it was quite scary. But um, we we did it. <laughs> my my colleague, Steve, you know, he he uh, he could he could foresee the the benefits ahead. And there were probably a, a couple of years where we were going, are we sure? Are we sure? And um, and then sure enough, it, it turned around and it's doing really well now. <laughs> I, I, I'll link this together on the basis of Steve Hadley, your colleague, yes, um, who is managing director, yes, used to be a lawyer, yes, going back long away. And one of our other podcasts that will go out in this series is with Tom Bourne, who also used to be a lawyer and is now doing a B Corp consultancy out there yeah um so there's threads of professional ex-professional services people kind of dotting the landscape of yeah. our more interesting companies out there yeah no definitely it's it's fascinating b corp is is really interesting something we would definitely aspire to to becoming a member of or accrediting to or whatever the term is um i know it, there's a there's a big preparation piece around measuring your carbon i think which we've we've started on that journey we've just appointed a sustainability manager um, which is exciting for us because sustainability ultimately is in the heart heart of everything we do because it's all about you know protecting our earth's precious resources by recycling as much as we can um and so her first job is to measure the, the carbon that we're currently um emitting and then we can develop a plan to sort of put in pro more green processes and um and and have a net zero target so yeah b corp certainly something we're aspiring to to achieving it's it's very good um but because it's so good i think people do underestimate sometimes quite how difficult it is even to start the journey you mentioned measuring there mm -hmm. that even establishing a base level to work from is not a five minute task no. it is quite involved just starting the journey absolutely. let alone making progress yes absolutely you need to put aside some investments that's what we've done with our recent um, appointment which is exciting you mentioned um, appointing a female sustainable manager, and we talked about this earlier. I'm being quite careful how I word this. Um, you could be seen as a, a female in a traditionally male orientated business. Have you found that interesting, difficult, challenging? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I've not taken any notice of it. Um, I am definitely, uh, you know, it is unusual, especially kind of in leadership. Um, but having said that, our senior management team consists of, of two females and three males, so that's fairly well balanced. Um, in the office, there's a there's a good half and half, you know, female to male. Um, but across the driver groups and the sort of recycling operative groups, there's still many, many, many more men. Um, there, we do have some females, which is fantastic. But we'd love to see more. Um, but no, I've I've never taken any notice of it. As I said, I, I grew up working in a, in a business and. And started my accountancy career very young and became qualified very young and had to line manage people that are older than me that are, that are male and just kind of took it took it in my stride really and and hopefully hopefully it's 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 been fine and 
yeah, I've never had any, any anything negative happen. Ideal. Um, you talked about different owners of the business as it went through. So it's been quite an evolution, especially over the last sort of decade with those different owners. Has that affected the culture? How has the culture changed over the period of the business? Um, I think as we've become more commercial, um, you have to invest in your culture. You know, the pe- we've got 2,000 customers now, whereas, you know, decades ago it was it was just the, the, the county council, if you like. But we want to have a great reputation. And to have a great reputation, our people need to be engaged because our people touch our customers every day. The drivers see see customers, our customer services team, talk to them and our sales team. And, you know, the operatives are influencing that customer experience in the amount that they recycle. Um, so employee engagement is really, really important. And actually, we haven't talked about employee ownership yet, but if you don't mind, this is a, a great intro to that because we realized that a fantastic model for our business, and we, we wish we'd realized it before, because of the, the, the high impact that our people have on um, our customers and our, our reputation, we thought, let's give these guys a vested interest in the business um, and ultimately that gives them that sense of ownership um, and that purpose and hopefully, you know, some more motivation to, to do an even better job um, for themselves and for the business. And then um, they ultimately uh, share in the success of the business. So we share the profits via a, a, a tax-free profit um, bonus scheme. Um, and not only financial, we, we listen to people more, much more than we did before. And we share more financial information now. And then we say, you know, do you understand this? And how can we help you understand more about how you're doing, how your team is doing, about how the business is doing? Um, we've recently set up a scheme called Coastal Champions, which is a, a group of people that represent each department. Um, and we hope that those guys can go and talk to their teams and get feedback and bring it up to the top. Um, because we've tried various ways to, to get people to talk to us. Steve and I, we do directed drop-ins and we want people to come and talk to us and, and tell us how they're feeling and what they've noticed and how the business could be better. Um, some people come and see us, many don't. And we, and we want to hear from people. So we're trying lots of different ways to get feedback from the business on how um, how it can be better. Well, quite a lot that ties into the conversation about B Corp because B Corp is about that engagement and that two ways. Obviously, employee ownership trusts are quite gaining some traction out there. Yeah. How, how long did the process take you on? What lessons did you learn from going through that process? Um, it wasn't too it wasn't um too long or difficult to be honest. It was fairly straightforward. I think once we had understood understood it and we thought this is this is beneficial for us this will um be the right model to take the business to another level i think the, i mean going back a step there were companies interested in acquiring us um and we thought about that and we explored it but we realized we've worked very very hard for coastal recycling's identity and it's got a strong brand and we wanted to secure that for the future um and protect its independence um, so we went down the, the the employee ownership route. And is there anything I'd learned differently? I think it's very difficult to know. The communication is the, the trickiest thing with 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 the people. Um, and we once we became employee owned, and we said to everybody, right, we're going to start sharing information with you now that you've you've not seen before, because we want to set aside money every year when we hit our targets. We'll, we'll pay that um, in tax free bonuses. So it was all very, very positive, um, which was great and a huge, you know, one of the best moments of my career going through that. But unfortunately, it's coincided with then um, the the COVID followed by the Ukraine war and the cost, you know, the energy crisis and a period of very difficult trading for us. Um, And we haven't been able to pay what we wanted to pay. And so it's then giving those very difficult messages and trying to manage that to say to people, it's still a very, very good business, you know, bear with us. Um, we, you know, we can make good money. It's just been a very difficult time and there will be bonuses ahead and let's focus on the future. And, you know, so ups and downs with all of that. And would I have done anything differently? I don't know. Probably not because I think you need to communicate and be open, but you know, would it have been better if we hadn't promised money that we now can't give? I think with with employee ownership, it's about being open book. And so we wanted to share our plans and share this is we were doing, you know, quite well, but until um, the recent cost uh, challenges came in and we've just had to be open and and share those and and, um, ride it out. 
Well, I think there's a nice underlying theme there from that in terms of that engagement actually being the critical element at the moment. And we see, I, I try not to be too political and controversial on this, but you see some of the um, strike actions and stuff like that being more driven by lack of engagement because the employees and the workers understand much more about the broader world. They understand yeah. about the crises and the rising prices and that type of yeah. stuff. They understand more about the business profitability side of things yeah. and are much more willing to engage if they are properly engaged. Yes, exactly. And I'm um, not saying we've got that 100% right. I'm sure we could get it more right, but people certainly do understand that. And hopefully they feel like they are more listened to. Um, we've yeah. tried to understand what does matter. You know, we don't have all the money in the world, but what can we do that does matter? And so our coastal champions might talk about things in working conditions where we, we can prioritize spends on things that really matter to people. Um, so yeah, and we've 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 done the best that we can with a with a with a pay rise as well. They've done a minimum of five percent, and some teams much more than that. So hopefully, yeah. It, whilst it's it's difficult news to absorb that there isn't a bonus, yeah. That there's there's there's, there's pay rises and there's a a, a a positive future ahead. I, th I think it comes back to that about just explaining it. One of the other podcasts we did um, was an IT company dealt that works in the public sector mainly, and therefore under all the pressures within the public sector. But they have much better two-way communications with staff to get that proper understanding across. And also so that there isn't that massive divide, so that you're not hiding stuff. You're not trying to be clever or anything else like that. You're literally saying, this is the broader picture. Um, I think there are perhaps some people in senior positions in our country that could perhaps learn some lessons from that. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll be told off if I get any more political okay. than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I'd probably take a twist on your advice on employee trust. I suppose your background and Steve's background actually really helped you in understanding the process, whereas some other perhaps business owners that hadn't got that background, it might take them a little while to yes. get used to that. That, that's definitely the case yeah um certainly around you know funding aspects and the legal aspects we we've got a good grasp on that um and it's very important with employee ownership that you get representation on the board of your employees um so we've got a very good um employee uh, trustee director she she's our hr manager um so she's best place for the job and she can bring that other dynamic to the board which isn't the finance and the law it's the people <laughs> in fact probably the most important how are the people? Um, so it's a well-balanced board. I come back to, we talked about um, uh, females within the workforce, that balance, also the employee on the board getting that proper balance yep. around that table yep. so that you're not sitting in a bubble isolated from everything and thinking everything is fine. You're actually getting proper feedback. That's right. And our, our business isn't, isn't so big that Steve and I aren't aware of what's going on. You know, we're very live and present and we, we we you know we we're on site we know the issues we hope hopefully people think we're approachable um so mostly news to us of how people are feeling isn't isn't a shock okay you mentioned pandemic there oh, we don't feature too heavily on the pandemic within the podcast but one thing i do see coming out of it and we talk with a few guests is the positives that we've seen from that period of time. What positives did you get from the pandemic, the changed experience, et cetera? The main one for me, overnight, I had to understand every day, how are we performing today? How many trucks are out on the road? How much income have we had? What are our costs? Do we need to furlough anyone? You know, So it, it became a bit of a monthly review of performance to daily, and that's continued. So from, that, from then, we now still... We, we started a morning call at 9 a.m. every morning during COVID. We still do it now. And we talk about what's going on today, what, what resources have we got, any issues have we got. Um, we can see our income. We can see our KPIs around recycling and tonnage in and processed, um, which has been a really good discipline so that we, we don't have to wait until three weeks after the end of the month to see how we performed. We're, we're, we're on it. Um, so, yeah, that's been a massive positive out of COVID. I do, I do. Pick up that to a certain extent in measurement, because you mentioned about measuring emissions and that type of stuff. Yeah. When we were talking before, measurement seems to be a key thing. And 
thinking about that when you're dealing with your customers yep. about not just your measuring yep. but their measuring how do you interact on that side yeah so that that is a big depending on the customer but bigger customers you know the bigger ones they have environment teams sustainability teams they are they have their own goals around um net zero or one of those aspects is waste management and can they reduce the waste that they're producing and they want to work with a partner who has an equal value they really care about the environment as we do and we can say yep we'll we'll absolutely partner with you on that we'll we'll come in visit your sites we'll look at what you're doing now we might comment on whether buying behaviors could change for example and, and less uh, waste could be produced on site um, change the way they segregate and separate wastes talk to staff about the importance of it and what can go in this bin and what can't go in that bin um so a lot of upfront talking and then once the waste comes to our site we having understood what should and shouldn't go in different skips um, we can then take photos and feedback when 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 something comes in that we're not expecting um some customers you know we, we know them to the point where we know that pallets shouldn't be in their skip because their suppliers should take them back we know certain packaging shouldn't be in there and so we, we work with them um, to give them that feedback and we'll do a, a report in any format that they want. Um, we give them yeah, recycling stats. Uh, there's also a portal where they can log on to our system to have a look at tickets live if they want to. Um, so yeah, we're working with customers all the time. Say, so what is it you want to understand and we'll help you achieve that. I suppose we've talked about before on these podcasts about supply chains becoming much more understanding we went from pre-pandemic of lots of integration but not much understanding post-pandemic there's much more understanding i suppose i hadn't appreciated from your business your customers are also supplying you with the materials at that stage so it's almost a, a a dichotomy you're getting customer relationships but also managing the supplies that are coming in, which is a bit strange on that side. Yeah, well, I guess we're a supplier to our customer. That's how they would they would see it. And so they want to know, as part of their scope three emissions, what our carbon is, um, measurements is. So that's another reason for us wanting to take have these um, calculations, because they'll say to us, um, how much carbon are you emitting on each journey for the skip load that you're you know taking from us and, and that kind of thing. So we are a supplier, you know, and a customer. We have to have those measurements for both purposes. I suppose that's, at least that then le levels the playing field a little between the two of you in ha not having to cooperate, but encouraging the cooperation side. Of yeah, things. absolutely. The better they can do, the better we can do, and the better we can do that. It's definitely a, a circular arrangement. Um, I did want to come on to a couple of specific things in terms of um, more social engagement from your side. Uh, could you talk the audience through um, a couple of your initiatives, the, the co-create and the tell the coast is clear initiatives? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we've realised that social value and sort of impact on community is really important and it's important to us anyway. But more recently, we've seen it actually on, a, on tenders. 10% 10 of a tender with a local authority will be awarded based on your social value input. Um, and so it's very important to us. We, we, the, 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 the examples you gave then, um, Till the Coast is Clear, we've worked with for, for several years. Um, they're a lovely charity um, that run uh, boats actually made out of recycled plastic, um, and they run around the South uh, Hounds area effectively pulling, pollution, pulling plastic pollution and other pollution out, out of the seas and shorelines. Um, and we, we sponsor them, so we, we give them sort of financial support, but then we'll also send volunteers from our business out to help on the boats. And we've also worked with, with uh, customers. Customers are often really keen to get involved in social value too, and certain customers more so than others. And it's really great because it's a way for us to work with them. So coastal people and customers will go on the same boat and um, and work together. So, yeah, that's, that's a lovely initiative. Um, and then co-create. More recently, we've got involved with them. They're, they're based in Exeter, another fantastic initiative that um, operate workshops for pe sort of vulnerable people, different different programs. But one of the program is woodwork and they teach woodwork skills. And so we donate our waste wood that's good condition. So we look through all of our waste wood and some of it is, is in very good condition, put it to the side, take it down to them, and then they'll use that in their in their programs. Um, and one particular house builder customer is, is excited about um, this this charity and we, we keep their wood that's in good condition separate, take it to co-create and co-create a building, bat boxes and bird boxes. 
out of that waste wood, which will then be placed on the, the residential developments that that house builder is, is building. So really nice story there um, for the, you know, how the waste wood is being used. And recycling and then encouraging bees. Yes. All the things that we are told about at the moment, our whole um, existence depends on bees. <laughs> so some <Yeah>. say. <laughs> okay. I, I want to pick up on one of your early points about energy within there, because obviously that's a slightly odd thing for a, a recycler to suddenly be involved in an energy business, especially in modern times of high energy prices. And you mentioned about powering 2000 homes how did that evolve and how how does that run well i mean it's been it's been in place for a long time um it's very common with landfill sites that methane is collected and and uh, gen electricity is generated so that that's that's been set up and it's it's and i say it's simple i'm sure it's not simple it's very it's very technical you know when it was all put in place but I see the, the 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 boreholes and the machinery all set up to extract, and it works. It w- works really, really well. The the gas extracted is on a curve, so now that the landfill is full, um, the gas will come down. But you know, it's still coming out thick and thick and fast at the moment, and it's doing really, really well. So that's quite common. Because your opening question was about energy and recycling doesn't go together. It, it does really, because of course, some recycling companies will run their own incinerators like Biffa and Virida, all the big ones, not the small ones, because they tend to send their waste to a third party um, incinerator. Okay, so I wasn't really aware of that connection between that waste and that energy production. How does it work in practice? Who do you interact with? What do you see coming out of that? Yeah, so we work with a company called Infinis. Um, they, they own the technology and the, the gas turbine and the grid connection, in fact, and they manage it all for us. So it's really easy for us. Um, the gas is extracted, mechanically operates, produces the energy. They maintain the systems and make sure everything's working smoothly. Um, and then they'll take a fee for their work, pay us um, a royalty based on energy price. And there's 2,000 homes in North Devon somewhere who Absolutely. are probably, are they aware of where their energy is coming from? Well, I don't know. We should probably make more of it, I'm sure. I'll, I'll get on to our marketing manager. <laughs> <laughs> do a leaflet drop around the houses. Do you realise? Or perhaps yes. do, they, do, you, do you want them to know of that? So it's very green. It's very renewable energy. You perhaps don't really want to know exactly where it comes from. <laughs> Um, one of the things we talked about before, which I found interesting, was about the stuff that you could do going forward. And one of the limitations that's a frustration of yours is that access to finance and the ability to fund some of the really exciting stuff that you would like to do. How restricted are you? Yeah, well, I think it's a very um, capital intensive business Um this industry generally because you've got the trucks on the road you know we constantly need to buy new trucks and you've got the containers that we need to that we need to replace um we've got the sort of loading machines um jcbs and all those kinds of things and then the actual processing equipment itself the big trommels and conveyor belts and separation equipment um so there's always something to replace and upgrade and that takes the majority of our sort of capex budget um in itself so when it comes to something like solar or um, converting to a hybrid hydrogen truck or something like that. I I would love to see more support from the government because it's a green initiative and it's important for the you know the country's future environmentally. Um, it would be great to just have a bit more support because we on you know we we there's a payback period by investing in in additional solar we would get our money back. But I'm comparing that against the payback period of upgrading our machinery or expanding with additional trucks etc and there just isn't enough cash to do it all or debt to do it all um so yeah I, I genuinely think the government should step in and support like they used to because i think it would have a much quicker impact and more companies would um would, would jump on board well, i think that's a national thing we have two crises one is productivity one is lack of investment generally but the lack of investment drives the lack of productivity increases that's going on yeah Um, so there is that need to be a bit more proactive ideal that's really good thank you for taking us through the business i just wanted to end on a a kind of random a kind of a, a more fun question relating to your activities um we know you participating things like sure clean personally and stuff like that what's the most random thing that you've actually found during a <laughs> um 
a lot of dog balls that end up in the sea, a lot of flip-flops, um, funnily enough, not matching ones. But once I did find kind of pair, a pair of matching ones or almost matching, and I thought, oh, brilliant, I'll take them home for my, my son. Took them home and, and soaked them to try and get rid of the stinky, sewage, smelly sea smell. Um, and they just disintegrated. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to recycle. I like the ambition. Yeah. You just I need shouldn't to have find washed them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you definitely should have washed them. I don't think that was necessarily the problem. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for joining us today and sharing your story. It's been really good to see about how what can be just seen as the behind the scenes, the dirty end of stuff, actually getting a flavour of how much effort is going in to contribute to that green underlying recyclable thing that is just a concern for all of us nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. When people visit our sites, they say we will ne we will always think twice about chucking something away now. We see how much effort goes into, you know, separating and recycling. It, <laughs> it's huge. And I hope uh, people take it seriously because if everyone does, it makes that little bit of extra difference. Definitely you know, on that side. We'll and thank you to our audience for listening to our latest episode of Business Doodles and Doodles. Hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to get updates and notifications on when our latest episode is available. Thank you very much, everyone.